we're going to talk about something called a bema in, in the Bible. That's the word that's used in Scripture. It's, it, it's translated as judgment seat, sometimes as tribunal or a couple other things. But to start off with, I, I want you to understand something. This isn't about the, the concept you may have heard growing up or whatever about how God is always angry and is out there to whack on people. This is kind of the opposite of that. So we're not going to talk about how God is whacking on people uh, because he's mad at them. That's not what judgment is in this context. And we're going to do that. However, a lot of people think about that. You know, what happens when your spouse says, we need to talk? Now, what, what do you start thinking? Oh, what in the world did I do wrong now? You know, and you know, that's, isn't that what you think sometimes when you get called into the principal's office? Now, some people have been called into the principal's office, and it's like, oh, God, what did I do now? You know, but, you know, I, I had a thing in, in high school where I got this thing, you know, we're in class, and they came, you need to go down to the principal's office right now. I'm like, what in the world, you know, is this about? And, you know, of course, some of the classmates are like, ah, he's finally getting his turn. You go down there, and it was a good thing. It was a good thing. There was a phone call, you know, from school about you've been accepted to school, and stuff. oh, okay. That's, that's the way they did it, and so it was a good thing. So being called into the judgment of the principal's office or your spouse's judgment or whatever isn't always a bad thing. It may always sometimes feel like that because that's the way we've been conditioned by the world, but we're going to talk about the biblical standard and God's standard. And you got to remember there's something that predicates all of this is that God is love. That's what scripture says, God is love, and those who love God, you know, fear is cast out, you know, perfect love casts out all fear. And so we want to keep that in the concept of what we're going to talk about today. But, you know, I want to show you a picture. I want you to look at this picture about in, in Corinth and in Philippi and places in the Bible, I mean, real scriptural places. These things are, are still exist, you know, of course, they kind of look like they're in ruins, um, but, you know, these, these sets of bricks. And so what it really was with the Bema is it was like a raised platform. And they would place a chair, a throne, a, a seat, depending on the status of the, uh, the person uh, passing judgment. But you can see the, those rows of bricks so that it would be elevated. So this would be out in public. And so the public in the, in the Agora, in the, in the marketplace, could see what was going on. And so people who were there for judgment, whether they were criminal or otherwise, would be uh, before the judgment seat in the marketplace in public. And so this, was, this is really the way it is. So when Paul talks about the judgment seat and talks about these things, this is, was real life. This is the way people lived in these days. Once again, uh, as I've said in other times, <clears throat> the Bible didn't create these words. I mean, the writers of the Bible didn't create words for the Bible. They took what was there. And so Peyton and I, this past week, were up in Virginia uh, visiting Parker and Maria and seeing the grandbaby for the first time. And, and <clears throat> so while we were there, Parker asked, well, what are you going to talk about on Sunday? And I told him what we were going to start off with about uh, Paul, and we'll get to that scripture here in just a second. But he said, you know, being a law student, and he's in his last semester of law school, and he says, you know, once you study law and you read Paul, you start seeing that Paul understood law because there are many terms in Scripture that are really legal terms for the day. They're, you know, about righteousness and judgment and, you know, and all these things. These are all legal terms that were actually used uh, in Paul's day in the first century. And so all of this uh, kind of thing talks about it from God's perspective, the biblical perspective. Isn't that necessarily the way we think about how the law was applied? So we're going to talk about this, about the biblical perspective of the judgment seat. That is the, uh, the Bema in Corinth. And there actually was a Byzantine church built around it back uh, in, in history, but over the centuries it got destroyed in some war. It was torn down. So the archaeologists have kind of recreated this to the, uh, the, the landscape around it, the way it was. But that Bema has been, has been standing there for over 2,000 years now. But we're going to go to Acts chapter 18 to start off with. 
and <clears throat> this takes place in that open area right in front of that set of rocks, that, those, uh, those bricks, those, those shaped rocks that are made into that Bema. So if you want to go to chapter 18, verses 12 through 17. But when Galileo, uh, that, he really is a real person. If you wanted to sit here and Google that and fact check me, you could find that. He has about four different names like Greek people did in those days, Roman people. <clears throat> but he's, he's commonly known in history as Galileo. Was proconsul of Achaia. <clears throat> now Achaia was the Roman province that Corinth existed in. If you think about Greece, that's the southern piece of Greece, a modern day Greece. <clears throat> so that and Macedonia would be the northern piece of it. That would be the province of the day in uh, the Roman world. The Jews, as in the Jewish leadership of the time, made it a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. Uh, a Latin type word for bema, that's, what, you know, that's, that's where that word bema is in the original language, tribunal, saying this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Well, of course, Paul's been accused of this before, but in this particular case, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or crime, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourself. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them away from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue. Now this is a different ruler of the synagogue than a few verses earlier. The ruler of the synagogue a few verses earlier in, in, the, in uh, Acts had become a Christian. So he lost his job as the lead, leader of the pastor of the synagogue and he'd been replaced by this guy Sosthenes who had kind of set up this scheme to get rid of Paul and, but, you know, the Romans wouldn't go for it. They, so what happened here? Galileo adjudicated or judged Paul to be righteous. The legal terms of the day, he was judged righteous, as in right standing in the community, right standing as a citizen. You could be judged righteous by the Roman law and, and, and the culture of the day, not necessarily meaning you're perfect. Just like Christians, be through, the, through Jesus, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be judged righteous when we come to faith through grace in Jesus. We're adjudicated as righteous. That's what scripture is getting at. It doesn't mean that we have become perfect or we earned something, but there was a price that was paid and we've been judged or adjudicated as righteous. So Paul, in this context, was adjudicated or judged as righteous uh, for the community. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Paul didn't even have to present a defense for himself. And this is important when we go to the next set of scriptures to understand and build this case about how the judgment of God for believers is a good thing. We receive uh, recognition and righteousness through this. But Paul didn't even have to defend himself here. When he tried to defend himself in other cases before other tribunals, he did have to speak. But in this case, he didn't have to do anything. And what I want to do is go to see an example of this in Revelation. If you go to Revelation chapter 20, <clears throat> uh, chapter 20, in Revelation, verses 11 through 15. Now, some people refer to this as the great white throne judgment, but, uh, or judgment before the great white throne. You know, your Bible may have headings in there or something, but the, the scripture says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Notice that this is plural, books were opened. Then another book, singular, another book, singular, was opened. And you might think, well, I'm, you know, Ray's cutting fine hairs here, singular, plural, and stuff. No, there's, there's a reason for this, is why the scripture is like this. And then another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, plural, 
according to what they had done. And so some people will take this and think that, well, God's judgment and our evaluation of going into heaven is based upon what we do. No, it's not based upon what we do. God is going to evaluate believers and non-believers based upon what we've done. But passage into heaven is based upon our faith and accepting the free gift of Jesus. Because if anyone's name was not found written in the book, the singular book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The judgment piece here, when you start looking at this, is that, yeah, there's an evaluation of what people have done written in those other books, the history. Now, you got to remember, whether there's literally a set of paper books that gets opened at the judgment is immaterial. Remember, with the way this is translated from modern day, it says books. They didn't have books like this in that day. It would have been scrolls. And so that word that's there that says, that says books is actually where we get our word for Bible, biblios. But those set of books say this is, is basically God's going to go back and say, you know, you did a really good job here. You know, you kind of doofed this up, but you did a really good job. Well, I'm proud of you. You did good. Now, on the other hand, if you're a non-believer and says, you know, here's the things you did, but all of these things indicate that you rejected faith because your name isn't found written in this other book of life. And so the actions indicate that you did something that rejected that faith and rejected what Jesus had done. And now, and this theme runs all the way through the Bible from the beginning to end. It's more or less obvious, but this theme of how we relate to God, how God evaluates us and stuff is, is all through Scripture. It's one of the unifying threads throughout Scripture. And so we're not going to go through and build all of these things up today because we just simply don't have time for that, but these are the threads that are there. And so that's an example of the judgment. But I want to go to a different place now and talk about what we see in Romans. In the, the, the book of Romans, chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 9 through 10. If we go there, because if you confess with your mouth, see, this is really, it really becomes a simple and straightforward thing to say. But the challenge is, is for people to get to the point where we can actually believe these things. Because we hear so many things out in the world today, and there's challenges spiritually and non-spiritually about where we believe and don't believe. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For, for from with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And so this is that general idea about do I believe? Will I be able to speak it out loud and say that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is my Lord? That's how you end up realistically in the book of life. It's not like there's some magic incantation where you have to say it in a particular way. You don't have to walk to the front of the church. You don't have to get, you know, slapped over the head with holy water. You don't even necessarily have to get dunked in a baptismal, right? You know, the issue is, is that do you believe? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you walk with Jesus? Jesus told some people and said, you know, at the judgment, you know, depart from me, for I never knew you. But we did all these things in your name. No, doing it in my name isn't what it's all about. It's having the relationship with Jesus, which is what judgment and salvation is really all about. But that's essentially the foundation. That's the foundation that we're, we're dealing with here. Beyond that, what do we do when we deal with our Christian lives beyond that foundation of relationship with Jesus. So I want to go to another verse of Scripture, and this is Romans chapter 14. If you want to look at it yourself and you know, make sure I'm really saying it correctly or whatever your translation is of Scripture that you're used to doing, it's good to use a consistent version for yourself when you read and study your Bible because you kind of get used to the flow and the relationship. 
And if you use King James, that's great. If you use English Standard Version like I tend to do, that's, that's cool and that's good. Uh, if you use a different version, that's fine too. Whatever works for you, but that doesn't mean that necessarily one is better than the other. And, and sometimes it's good to look at multiple versions, but chapter 14, verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat, once again, the Bema, the Bema of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God or confess praise or glory to God. Uh, and as that word could also be translated. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So Paul was called before the Bema in Corinth, and he was being called to give an account of himself. But he didn't have to get there. He was adjudicated as righteous. He didn't even have to give a defense. At the great white throne judgment, believers won't have to give a defense. Their name is found written in the book of life. They will get evaluated on their acts and behaviors and stuff like that, what they've done for the kingdom, but not in terms of punishment or judgment, but on recognition for God. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, I think you understand already from what I've said, if it's the thing about doing evil, that's, that's an indication that you didn't have that relationship with Jesus and you weren't following Jesus. You, you know, that's, that's an indication or, or judgment characteristic evidence if you don't have that foundational relationship. But if you're being judged for what's good, God isn't whacking on you for doing good. You need to understand that God is recognizing you for, for doing well. There's going to be different levels of recognition. God is like, hey, good. You know, now what that means in terms of scripture of eternity, no one really knows because scripture says no mind is conceived or ear is heard or eye is seen what God has intended for those who love him. However, there are indications in throughout scripture that there are different levels of reward for what you've done. There are not different levels of salvation. There is either salvation or not, but there aren't there are, do appear to be different weights of glory and recognition. And so we saw that in there, but if we want to go, and I know I'm bouncing through a lot of scriptures right now today, but next is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 10 through 15. Now, according to the grace of God given to me, this is Paul speaking. So Paul's writing these things. Like a skilled master builder, I laid this foundation and someone else builds upon that. This is over time. But the foundation is there's only one thing that can be laid, and that's Jesus Christ. There's this relationship with Jesus. That's the only foundation. Everything else that could be built, if it's not found founded, established, built upon the foundation of Jesus, then it's going to crumble and fall. And here, Paul's talking about this foundation that was laid, which is Jesus, but you can build upon that in this way. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, Straw, or straw, as this translation says, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose, disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. Okay, so the issue is, you don't maintain your salvation through works. You have salvation through Jesus, but you don't maintain that through works. When you, know, when you have a relationship with Jesus, you have a relationship with Jesus. Okay, now, if you live like a pagan and you act like a pagan, you talk like a pagan, odds are that you probably are a pagan, okay? You know, and, you know if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, smells like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? Rather than a sparrow. 
So the deal is, is that, you know, <laughs> the Bible says to examine yourselves to see if you really are in the faith. Okay, we should do that. We should make sure we're in the faith. But that doesn't mean you can lose it. I'm not saying that you can lose your relationship with God. Now, there are situations where maybe you can turn away from God, you can walk away from God, you can live for the world, but the issue here is, is that if you live, act, talk, and stuff like a pagan, maybe you really are still a pagan, okay? Uh, and so there are righteous pagans. There are well behaved pagans. Pagans are not necessarily always wild, crazy people, but they, they do not live in a godly manner. But you have this thing about, can you build in gold, silver, precious stones, wood, or hay? You know, once, you know, Tony, uh, Tony, Peyton, I'm sorry, Tony, Peyton, you know, I mean, they, they, they kind of look the same, you know, except for hair color. And so the deal is, is that it went, okay, a few years ago, you know, I could walk into a room and if they weren't looking at me, it's, well, which one is that? You know, and it's like, you know, the deal is, is that, now you can tell Tony a little bit more with the hair color, but, you know, so, so excuse me if I get their names mixed up. And so, um, anyway, Peyton and I were driving back, and there was a harvest had gone through, and so they're burning some of the stubble in the fields, and so, you know, the smoke, it burns up and it collapses and, and does the thing there in uh, Arkansas. Some of that rice stubble that's, that's in the fields is being burned off, and so it's, it, it burns quickly. It doesn't last. Now, if you have other things, though, fire gets exposed to, it doesn't collapse. It doesn't burn. Regular fire doesn't damage gold and silver. If it gets hot enough, of course, it'll melt, but it doesn't change it from what it is. Stubble, wood, hay, when it burns, it's, it's, it's consumed and it's changed into more basic elements. But we all have this situation that when we get evaluated, what we've done will either stand or it won't stand before God. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's go to another verse. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 through 18. And this is talking about the weight of glory. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Okay, so you have this situation that what really matters isn't the work in and of itself, but what is your motivation, your unseen motivation and thought and desire? What are the things of the heart that, that caused you to do the things you do. And God is, you know, it, it says God, you know, you can go back to like King David and stuff like that. Well, like I said, this stuff is, runs all the way through scripture, in and out. It's a thread that weaves in there. <clears throat> it says God sees the heart. When King David, uh, the prophet went to anoint the new king because he had rejected Saul and it was going to be David. You know, the, the prophet says, oh, hey, here's one of Jesse's kids. This guy is big, he's tall, he's handsome and all this stuff. He must be the king, the future king. And God said, no, he's not. For I look at the heart. God evaluates the heart. And God picked David out there shepherding the sheep because he saw the heart. He looks at the heart. Those are the things that are unseen. What are your motivations? How do you do this? <clears throat> Are you doing things for God, striving to do things for God because you're afraid? Are you striving to do things for God because of you want to have your own glory? Are you doing things for God because, hey, you know, we can build this enterprise, we can do this, and more money will come in, and we can, you know, da 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 You know, televangelist, you know, you know you can, some of them are really really wonderful people. And some of them can just turn your stomach because it seems like all they care about is money, right? You know, send us money, send us money, send us money. And we need to separate this thing about God and relationship from money stuff. Don was telling the story in the, the Sunday school thing, and I know I didn't talk to you, Don, but I'm going to use your story anyway. 
And so <clears throat> he was talking about how he had visited this, this person who was a shut-in because of illness, and he had taken communion stuff to him and to do communion with him and share communion. And <clears throat> after the communion and the time of visiting, the guy said, well, I need to give a, an offering to the church. Well, you don't need to give an offering for church. Well, no, we had communion. I need to give an offering to the church. You know, and you've got you to gotta give. You know, if you receive something from the church, you've got to give to the church. If you receive something from the church, it's just communion. No, you've got to you gotta do this. And if, if you think I'm exaggerating, you can go check it out with Dawn afterwards. But uh, the deal is, is that, no, the, the, we are not expected to give to get grace. Okay, yeah, it's amen. We, we don't, grace is a free and unmerited thing. We don't have to give to receive the grace of God. We don't have to earn the grace of God. But God expects us to do something too. You know, if you have kids, you love them, you do things for them or whatever, but you expect them to do something in life, right? I mean, you know, John might get tired of having kids for the next 40 years in the house, you know. <laughs> Michelle might not get tired of it, but you now John might get tired of it. And, and so, but the deal is, is when they're there, you, you gotta do something, right, occasionally. The deal is, is that we don't have to earn from God. We don't have to do that. God wants us to go out, stand up, be fully developed humans, fully developed Christians, fully developed in the ways of faith. We're supposed to grow and develop, to study and show ourselves approved unto God as we advance and grow and become conformed into the image of Christ. But the motivations that are there are what's really important. God looks at the heart and understands why are we doing what we are doing. So those are the challenges that we have. But I want to look at another scripture real quick. It's 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5. I know we're bouncing back and forth. But all of this stuff ties together. 4, 1 through 5. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In other words, God wants us to be His hands and His feet, His servants, His stewards, the way things are being done. This is what God wants us to do. We're called to be part of that. We're not you know, called to come in, get saved, and sit in a church pew for the next umpteen decades until we go to heaven. We're called to be active participants in the kingdom of God, actively working to advance God's purposes. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So we're stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required, required of stewards that they be found faithful, so God expects us to be faithful to the Word of God, faithful to His calling, faithful to the mission that He's given us. So God calls us to be faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing. Remember, this is Paul talking now. A very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Remember, it's, it's still using these same legal terms that we've been talking about all day. Judged by you or any human court, any Bema. In fact, I do not even judge myself. This is Paul speaking. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. Just because I think I'm good, holy, righteous, perfect, doesn't mean that I am. You know, I, I, Tony reminds me occasionally of frequently, you know, of, of my lack of perfection, you know. But, you know, it's true. There is lack of perfection. I may not recognize those things, but, you know, other people do. Other people in the church, other people in the community may recognize. So just because I'm not aware of anything in myself doesn't mean I'm acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Because humans can't always see what's in the heart or what's the motivational situation. Therefore, I do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light these hidden things, these hidden motivations, and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Then each will receive his commendation from God. And commendation is not condemnation, all right? God's not slamming on you, putting it down. 
Commendation is recognition. Commendation is praise. You're commended, you're built up, you're recognized. That's commendation, not condemnation, commendation, you know. So I just want, I'm going to emphasize it because I want people not to be confused. God loves you. God loves us. As doofy as I myself may be, God loves me just as doofy as I am. But that doesn't mean that he wants me to stay as doofy as I am. He wants me to continue to improve and grow and be conformed into the image of Christ, or conformed into the image of God as seen in Christ, who is the unseen, is the represent, perfect representation of the unseen God, to make it more complete in the statement. But then each will receive his commendation from God. What I want you to get out of all of these things is God loves you and the judgment seat of God for a believer is not to get thumped on. Some people think, oh, well, my, my, my husband, my spouse, my cousin, he's just going to get straightened out. When he dies, God's going to thump him, get him good. Okay, get him straightened out. Oh, well, guess what? No, he's not. To, to, to be out of the body to, is to be with God. You know, you're not going to get thumped like that because God loves you, okay? You know, the, you know we could build that, that theology statement, you know, go through Scripture and find that, but God loves us as we are. It, uh, that doesn't mean He wants us to stay where we are. We want, he wants us to continue to grow and improve and do things to advance the kingdom because we're stewards of the mysteries of God and he's called us to advance that kingdom through the use of those mysteries of God. And, and one more thing from Matthew, from Jesus. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Matthew 16, verse 27. I find it here. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And so, like I said, this theme runs all through Scripture. It's in the prophets of the Old Testament. Jesus speaks of it. Paul writes about it. John wrote about it in Revelation. This theme runs all through Scripture. Yeah, there's a judgment seat. There's eternal judgment in terms of where you end up. But like I said, it's in terms of, do you have that foundation of Jesus Christ? Do you have that relationship with Jesus? After that, it's about what are you doing for Jesus because we love him. We don't do things because we're trying to earn a relationship. We don't do them because we're trying to earn love. We do them because God first loved us and we love God, and therefore we do these actions because we love God. You know, you know, Tawny puts up with me because she loves me. You know, so like I said, you know, I can be pretty doofy. You know, just like, you know, I I can give you examples, but y'all know enough examples already about how I can be doofy and strange. So <clears throat> we all have these kind of characteristics. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what are we going to do with them? How are we going to continue to improve and deal with our walk with Jesus? But God loves us as we are. So we're going to pray. And I want you to think for a minute. Am I in the faith? Do I have that relationship with Jesus? And for some of you, you're just like, yeah, I've examined myself before. I, I have this relationship with Jesus. I love God, and I have this relationship. But some people haven't necessarily done that, and some people aren't really in the faith. But beyond that, I want you to think about where do I stand with God in terms of what am I doing? Am I doing for something for the kingdom? Am I being a steward of the things of God and working through the kingdom the way he's called me to be? Am I doing those things out of obligation because I'm trying to earn something? Or am I doing them because I love God? 
when you're doing them out of love, you're not doing it, you're not striving. You're not trying to make it happen. You're doing it because I like this. Okay? I like going to work at Visto or ABBA or some other thing that's advancing the kingdom. It's putting into practice the stewardship type thing that was just mentioned in Scripture. I'm doing those things. So, Lord Jesus, I, I pray for us here today. I pray that you help us to think through our relationship with you. And if there's anybody here today that's out of that relationship with you, either because they've never had a real relationship with you or because they've fallen away and they're just living for themselves, living in the world. <clears throat> and they need to come back into a right standing with you. I pray, Father God, that that foundation of Jesus Christ in their life be established if it's never been there and be reestablished if it was once there and now something's amiss. And so if you, if you look at yourself and say, I, I've, never, I've never trusted Jesus. I've never acknowledged him as Lord of my life. I've been in church. I grew up in church, but I've never, never had that relationship. I want you to think about that right now. There's no magical set of words that establishes that relationship. It's a faith thing. It's a thing of the heart, of the mind, of the soul. Jesus, I want to follow you. I acknowledge that you are the Lord God. You are now Lord of my life. I submit myself to you. And I follow you. And I want to have relationship with you. And I thank you that you first loved me. For you so loved, for God so loved the world. He sent you, Jesus, that you might die for me and set me free from hell, death, and the grave. I thank you for a love that's so mysterious and so full and so abundant that, that you could do those things. And I acknowledge you as my Lord. Now, if, if you have that relationship with Jesus, but you haven't been walking in that relationship. You haven't been living that way. You've been trying to earn some relationship with God. I, I'm going to encourage you to cease striving. I'm going to encourage you to say, God, show me what you want me to do. I'm open to you because you're my Lord. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? But I'm going to do it in peace and in love. I'm not stressed or strained. I'm not going to strive over it. Because your word doesn't call me to strive over it. It calls me to do things for you. And I do them because I love you and I have that relationship with you. So I pray that everybody here has that love relationship with Jesus. So they can do these things and advance the kingdom. As scripture says, to be stewards of the mysteries of, the, of God mysteries of the kingdom these things that are revealed these mysteries are not as in hidden things they're mysteries that have been revealed through scripture and by God himself these are the things that we are stewards of and I pray that everybody here be wise and good stewards of the kingdom of God and that we work and move forward the kingdom but at the same time that we don't have to fear judgment we don't have to worry about that because we have that relationship with God. Our names are found written in the book of life. And the other judgment is about the recognition, the glory, the advancement, the place in the kingdom that God has granted to us for those who love him. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done, for setting us free from hell, death, and the grave. Thank you, Jesus, so much. Thank you, Jesus.
And before we depart, I'm going to pray this scripture over you, that according to the riches of His glory, God may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. <clears throat> now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever Amen. Thank you for being here today. Go forth in the grace and love of God. Be wise stewards of the kingdom of God. And remember it, above all else, God loves you. God, God loves you.